That is one of my favorite parts of the movie. All the kids refer to the treasure as the rich stuff over and over and over again. It's not like a one-off statement that one of them makes. Is it treasure is... is treasure like a copyrighted term or something? <laughs> or were they going to have to pay royalties for using basic English? Welcome to Pennies and Popcorn, the show about real money lessons from the world of TV and movies. With your hosts, Carla Cash and Robert Davidson, a couple of personal finance geeks and movie lovers. Hey guys, welcome to a throwback episode of Pennies and Popcorn. We are cranking it back to 1985 and talking about the Goonies. I can't believe you made me watch this in order to do this episode. <laughs> I loved the Goonies when I was a kid, and rewatching it was like a pure joy for me. I just had a blast. But I understand that it does not hold the same nostalgia factor for you. You were not as big of a fan when you were a kid. Yeah, I didn't watch this a bunch when I was a child. And as I became a young adult and a real adult, I never understood the appeal. Well, as an adult, there are a lot of real world things that just don't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> so true. Um, so we're going to get into that today. But from like a innocent child perspective, all of the muddy stuff just kind of goes over your head and you just get like wrapped up in the treasure hunt story. So from that perspective, I still really enjoy this movie. But yeah, what rewatching it as an adult is like, wait, what is happening? What are you trying to convince me of? There's a lot of things that are just like completely ridiculous and wildly outlandish. And yeah, you got to suspend a lot of disbelief to really enjoy the Goonies. But hopefully you can put yourself in that mindset today. Or you can come at it with a super critical eye like we're going to do and uh, dig into all of the flaws. I think my favorite flaw is that Josh Brolin and Sean Astin are friends. Right? They're siblings, but like really? But they... Would they get along at all, even a little bit? I mean, they're brothers. It makes total sense that they would love each other and get along. I don't see it. I don't see it. <laughs> well, I have to admit that Josh Brolin was one of the reasons that I was into this movie when I was a kid. Still a fan of Josh Brolin to this day. But uh, yeah, he is um, probably, out of the actors in this movie, the one who's gone on to have the most successful career. I don't know, it's debatable. Come on, what about Rudy? Yeah, Sean Astin has also had an incredible career. I think the two of them have done great. Martha Plimpton has also had a pretty successful career. She's been in a lot of TV shows. I'm not sure is that successful, because I don't know who Martha Plimpton is. Well, she's that girl from the Goonies. And I think she was on this show called Raising Hope, like 85% sure on that. But yeah, she's had a pretty successful TV career. Her IMDb list is very lengthy. So she's gone on to, to have some pretty good success in the movie and TV industry, which is pretty neat. So one of my favorite fun facts about this show has to do with Jeff Cohen, um, who played Chunk, a.k.a. Lawrence, um, as a child actor. That kid is so adorable, and he had to do this truffle shuffle dance in the movie. Which is so not PC. Did Steven Spielberg convince America that fat shaming was okay in the 1980s? I guess he did. Yeah, it was a very not nice scene in the movie when the kids make him basically like shake his tummy around in order for him to come hang out with them. Um, but it is like one of the things that people remember about that movie was the truffle shuffle um, that they made him do. But I did read that the poor kid was so embarrassed to do it on set that they had to like clear the set and get everybody away so that he would feel comfortable enough to shoot that scene because it was, it was really hard on him. Wow, it's like the precursor to the today's intimacy coordinators on set. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he has grown up to have a super awesome life. He is an attorney now. And he practices mostly in the entertainment law industry, which is pretty cool. So yeah, Chunk grew up to be a pretty cool human being. About the only fun fact I know from the movie is that Sloth, the kind of monster guy, uh, he is wearing a t-shirt for the Oakland Raiders. It turns out that the actor who played Sloth actually played for the Oakland Raiders. So uh -huh. fun fact. Well, we have a lot of like fun, interesting things that we're going to dig into with this movie. We're going to get into the nitty gritty of like how much we think the treasure was worth and 
things about like maritime law, so I think we should probably go ahead and dive in. So for those of you who haven't seen it since roughly 1985 or thereabouts, we can do just a super high level plot summary. So basically you've got a, a collection of families who live in an area of Astoria, Oregon that is referred to as the Goondocks. That's kind of like a lower end area of town and they have, they call themselves the Goonies because that is, they all live in the Goon Docks and they're all really close friends and they love living there and they, they do live in a beautiful spot. It's in Astoria, Oregon, which is right on the coast, an absolutely gorgeous area, which we've been lucky enough to visit. Um, and they are facing foreclosure. Their parents are like having money troubles and we'll get into the details later, but basically all you need to know is the families are facing foreclosure and are looking at having to move and the kids decide that they are going to go on this quest to try to find lost treasure and hopefully find a bunch of money, fix all their parents' financial problems and save their own lives in a way because they love living in the goondocks and they all love being friends with each other. So they're kind of like fighting for their lives as the goonies and that lifestyle that they all have together. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Yeah, that sounds fair. Okay. So I think with that in mind, we can dive into our very first clip where we hear the kids talking about this imminent bad thing of having to move that's going to happen and how the kids are just kind of devastated about it. Hey, any of you guys ever hear of Detroit? No. Certainly. When Motown started. That's got the highest murder rate in the country. Well, let me tell you what, that's where we move in or we'll lose a house tomorrow. You shut up about that stuff, it'll never happen. My dad will fix it. Yeah, sure he will. If he gets his next 400 paychecks by tomorrow afternoon. That's wrong, Brent. It won't happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Rudy's dad, dad is going to save the day. He'll fix it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the first question to address here is what in the world is going on? Why are all of these houses looking at being foreclosed upon at exactly the same time? That is a wonderful question because it makes zero sense. You've got Rudy and Josh Brolin's dad who works in a museum. You've got somebody else's dad who's like a plumber. Somebody else's parents do something else. Like I don't remember all the jobs of the parents, but they're not the same. It's not like they work at the factory that just shut down and now none of them have been able to pay their mortgage in the last couple of months, and they're facing foreclosure, what possibly could have happened that would have adjusted all of their industries so substantially that their homes are being foreclosed on? It makes no sense. And this is why I hate the movie. <laughs> it is a very strange premise. So you have all these people who live in this one area, this one neighborhood of Astoria, Oregon. So the plot is that there is somebody, whether it's the city or just like a private investor, we don't know, but somebody wants to turn the Goondocks neighborhood into a country club slash golf course. Right. There's an existing country club and they're expanding. Yeah. So, I mean, that is not an imminent domain situation, I wouldn't think, where somebody would have the, like, the power of the government behind them to come in and say, like, this land needs to be used for some specific purpose. We have the right to, you know, pay you the value of your house and kick you out and evict you. It doesn't seem like a very appropriate use of eminent domain. Well, even if it were an eminent domain situation, why would getting some treasure help them out of the problem? Yeah, right? that is exactly no amount of money true. is going to solve that for yeah. you. Yeah, if it's eminent domain, then treasure won't solve the problem. So it's clearly some kind of financial crisis, but. Why would all of them be facing it at the same time? Now, obviously, there have been periods in history where, you know, people from all different walks of life and industries are really struggling at the same time. Obviously, the Great Depression, the Great Recession, those things can happen. But I would say if you have a community falling apart, you're probably not making a big investment in a country club. Exactly. So that possible explanation doesn't really jive. Now, one thing that people do talk about on the internet is that possibly... Josh Brolin and Sean Astin's family were landlords. Like they owned a lot of the other properties that are also going to be foreclosed on and they haven't been able to make the payments on any of their properties. 
So it all comes down to that one family failing. So the hypothesis is that they are the landlords over all of their friends' families. And that even still, wouldn't they be paying their rent? And it it would be really unlikely for all of those houses to go in foreclosure at the same time. Yeah, unless maybe it was some kind of like super generous thing where they were charging them crazy low rents that didn't actually cover the mortgage. But why would anyone do that it just nothing about this makes any sense maybe rudy's dad is a serial gambler and he's been taking the rents that have been paid and going to the casinos losing that money and no longer having enough to pay the mortgage payments that he's over leveraged on that that is the only possibility i can come (laughs) up with for there to actually be this plot in the movie yeah that makes sense some kind of like super frivolous spending habit or gambling habit or who knows what um But yeah, it would have to come down to like one family blowing all of that money, (laughs) which just seems highly unlikely. Also, he's presented as like a nice, you know, Disney dad. We don't see any serious character flaws or anything. So I don't know. But you hear Josh Brolin making the comment, if if his dad gets his next 400 paychecks, then everything will be fine. So that does sort of hold up to the theory, right? Because 400 paychecks, if you get paid every other week, is over 15 years of pay, yeah, which would be more than enough to pay your back mortgage if you're just worried about your own home. Um, by a lot. Yeah, one would hope. 15 years of mortgage payments is quite a lot. Um, no, f- 15 years of income. 15 years of paychecks. Yeah, 15 years of paychecks is a lot of paychecks. So I don't know. I mean, nothing about it jives, really, except possibly the dad is gambling addict explanation, which no one... There's, there's no other evidence for that other than our pure hypothesis. So. All right. So we just need to set reality aside and assume yeah. that these families have all undergone some sort of financial strife at the same time in a community that still wants to invest heavily in a country club. Not everyone knows a lot about foreclosure, fortunately. It's not something that every family has to deal with in the United States today. How behind do you need to be on your payments in order for foreclosure to really be an issue for you? So banks are not allowed to begin foreclosure proceedings until you are 120 days behind on your mortgage. So you're looking at being about four months behind, which is, that's that's pretty far behind. Okay. And do we know how long that foreclosure process takes? I think it varies from state to state and situation to situation, but I mean, it's it's generally not an overnight process. You have a chance to, to make things right and um, get back to being current on your loan. So you're looking at at least a month's long process. Yeah, I would think that if you're somehow, even after they've started the, the foreclosure proceedings, if you're somehow able to come up with that money and pay them back, they'd be happy to let you stay there and continue doing your thing because the foreclosure process is messy and expensive for them and they'd prefer not to do it. Yeah, no question. So did you look into how common foreclosures are in America today? I did. And I think we're probably at a really great time for people when it comes to this sort of issue. Uh, In the recent past, uh, we're kind of at a low point. Only 0.11% of homes uh, were foreclosed on in 2021. That's like one in every 900 homes. And I suspect this has to do with a handful of factors. One, there's been a lot of COVID relief money out there and relief programs to help people who are in housing difficulty to make their way through some stuff. So that has certainly helped out a number of folks. And then two, it feels like in darn near every major metropolitan area right now, housing prices have just climbed through the roof, which means that if you are behind on your mortgage, your options aren't necessarily to simply go into foreclosure and let the bank take it and whatever equity you had that may be less than the value of your uh, of the home itself or whatever uh, your your outstanding equities is no good you may be able to sell the home right you may not have to face a short sale because more than likely the value of the home has gone up considerably since you bought it in a lot of areas yeah that's very true i did also check to see where foreclosures are most common versus least common so the state with the most foreclosures in america is illinois which I thought was kind of interesting and sort of random, followed pretty closely by New Jersey. The state with the least amount of foreclosures was Montana, which I suppose makes sense. Are we talking percentages here? (laughs) How many homes are there in Montana? (laughs) Yes, we're talking percentages. So both people got to keep their houses. (laughs) But I'm sure the low population has a lot to do with it, right? There's just aren't 
uh, I, it's I'm, hard to have a job where you you are able to be extended credit in the first place in Montana. So <laughs> I have to imagine that yes, uh, the population who is in financial strife is a lower fraction than the rest of the country. I did read that in the recent past, foreclosures peaked in 2010 at about 2.23%, which is about one in every 45 people. That's a lot. Um, getting their homes foreclosed on. Yeah, which is a pretty big, pretty big number. And that makes sense, right? We were in the middle of the Great Recession or starting to come out of it, but home prices had definitely bottomed out. So if you fell behind at all, the bank was ready to just take it off your hands and see what they could do about it. Or there were plenty of people who maybe strategically said, look, I'm, I bought this house for tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars more than it's worth right now. And it seems crazy for me to keep paying on it when I'm really not able to make ends meet. There's, there's no point in me going into personal debt even further over this. Let's just, let's foreclose. I did want to talk about just the impact of these foreclosures because there was an interesting study I read about that said that 36.7% of people in this one study who had had their homes foreclosed on met the criteria for major depression. Mm. Yeah, that's not shocking. I mean, where you live is such an important part of who you are and your self-worth. I can completely understand that. Yeah. So I suppose as much as I dislike, I, I like Rudy. I dislike little Rudy here in this By movie. By Rudy, you mean Sean Astin in case anyone is not Did he do him. any other roles? Is he famous for anything else? I'm just going to pretend you didn't say that and offend the billions of Lord of the Ring fans out there who associate Sean Astin with playing Samwise Gimji or the billions of Stranger Things fans out there who associate him with being Bob. So yeah, I'm just going to, we're just going to pretend that didn't happen. So anyway, Rudy <laughs> and his friends, I think they, they did have a good reason to do every effort they possibly could to try to get their family out of this financial position because it could be pretty tough on their family's mental health. So let's hear about their whole experience of discovering the potential for this treasure that's out there. Hey, you guys, look at it. Hey, you guys ever heard of this guy, look, Chester Copperpot? Chester Copperpot. Look, it says... Chester Copperpot, missing while in pursuit of local legend. Reclusive scavenger claims I have the key to one-eyed Willie. Wow, do you guys realize what we could do? Nobody ever found nothing, you guys. I mean, why do you think this map would be up here in this attic when it could be in some safety deposit box somewhere, right? That's right. And anyway, if Chester Copperpot didn't find it, how would we find it? But what if, you guys, just what if this map could lead to one-eyed Willie's rich stuff? Maybe. Then we wouldn't have to leave the Goondocks. All right, I will refer to him briefly as Samwise Gimji because of the way he's talking about the rich stuff. What is that? <laughs> Who talks like that? That is one of my favorite parts of the movie. All the kids refer to the treasure as the rich stuff over and over and over again. It's not like a one-off statement that one of them makes. Is it treasure is... is treasure like a copyrighted term or something? <laughs> or were they gonna have to pay royalties for using basic English? I don't know why they call it the rich stuff. Maybe like we're just a little bit too young for that. Like maybe because I mean the Goonies came out when we were just infants. But I don't know. Maybe people called treasure rich stuff before we were kicking and. Becoming real humans? I don't know. Please leave but... a comment if you grew up speaking of <laughs> the rich stuff. I think it's adorable that they say that, and it makes me smile every single time I hear it. And now I just want to call treasure the rich stuff from, <laughs> from here to eternity. <laughs> so I do think it's interesting that they found this map. And I guess I want to talk about real-life treasure hunts because those do exist occasionally in the world. They sure do. So the one that I wanted to talk about is hits pretty close to home for us. So there was a guy named Forrest Fenn, which is a good name for like a treasury sort of guy. Yeah, I think so. And he was a collector of all kinds of historical artifacts. Um, and he had a... Do, do you mean rich stuff? <laughs> I mean rich stuff. And he had amassed this collection of like gold bullions, gold nuggets, like rubies and... Um, in particular, a chest, like an actual treasure chest, which was in and of itself a treasure, because I think it was from the 12th century, and it was like really ornately carved and um, was supposed to be like this beautiful object. So he had amassed all this stuff, and as he was getting older in life, he decided that he wanted to create a real-life treasure hunt. 
So he took this treasure and buried it, or hid it, somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. He put out some kind of poem that had a bunch of clues about where people could potentially find this treasure chest full of gold, etc. And thousands and thousands of people became just thoroughly obsessed with it and pretty much like dedicated their lives to finding this treasure. So they walked around destroying the Rocky Mountains, digging up holes everywhere, trying to find this treasure, which by the way, I want to ask, this 12th century chest that this came in, like, how did he protect that? Did he just take this really expensive chest and throw it in the dirt somewhere? Or did he like wrap it in something and then seal it in some sort of, did he, did he put it in one of those things that like you're supposed to put your leftover food in and remove all the air? He vacuum sealed it? Yeah. Unclear. I like to imagine that he went to Walmart and bought like a plastic tub and just put the whole thing in the plastic tub. (laughs) So that's what you, (laughs) surely it was transparent. So you could identify that it had the the rich stuff inside. The rich stuff. Yeah. Got to be able to see it. So one of those like see-through giant Tupperwares, that's what I'm picturing in my head. No, uh, yeah, I guess he would have had to have found the treasure in order to answer that question. But surely he took some precautions to protect this like priceless artifact. But in any event, um, he buried the treasure, I think, in like 2010. And somebody found it pretty recently in like 20 or 21. So it was like 10 years after he had buried it or hidden it. Um, the guy who found it originally wanted to remain anonymous, which makes total sense. Can't tell anybody about your rich stuff. Can't tell anybody about that. But, um, there were a lot of lawsuits that came after the treasure was found. And when it became clear that he was going to be named in a lawsuit, he felt like, well, I might as well come out now. So he publicly came out and said who he was. Why were there lawsuits? So there was one person who sued the who sued Forrest Fenn, the guy who planted the treasure, because he claimed that he had figured out the location but hadn't actually had a chance to go get it yet because of COVID concerns, I think is what it was. But he said that he had emailed Forrest Fenn and told him, I know exactly where the treasure is. Here's where it is. I'm going to go get it. And he thinks that Forrest Fenn then moved it after he got the email from him. So he was suing him for having moved the, moved the stuff around. Then there was another woman. How did that turn out? Do we know? Because surely you don't have a claim for, I hid something. It was giving it to whoever could find it. And then you moved it. Like, is that an intentional tort? Is that intentional infliction of emotional distress? Yeah, I, I, I can't even begin to guess what that claim would be sitting There's no here breach of contract of head, here. But I, I don't know how that lawsuit turned out or if it has even turned out, knowing how slowly lawsuits move, it may very well still be pending. Um, but there was another woman who brought a second lawsuit against the guy who had actually found the treasure, claiming that he had like hacked into her emails and text messages Um, and that she had solved it and figured out where it was and that that's the only way that he was able to find it was by hacking into her stuff. So she was suing him for that whole thing of hacking her. So I don't know how that one has turned out either, but apparently there's no rest for the treasure finders because there's a lot of lawsuits that are coming out of the woodwork out in the aftermath of someone finding this treasure chest. I've heard of people coming after you for winning the lottery and having that kind of windfall, but I, I didn't know that Forrest Fenn's prize you know, garnered so much attention and people were really going to go for their unfair share of that money. People were super into it. So it's not exactly clear what the value of it was because I don't think he was super specific about what he had put into the treasure chest, but the estimates are anywhere between one and $5 million. So it's a, a good chunk of change. It's definitely worth doing some hiking for, but it was a very dangerous enterprise. Five people died in the process of searching for Forrest Fenn's treasure. Do we know what happened to them? Were they people who just like fell off of some sort of cliff or got swept away in a raging river trying to cross it in uh, the wrong time of year? I don't know all five stories, but I think it was just like, you know, the sheer desperation of it caused people to go into conditions that they weren't fully prepared for. And as we well know, we can see the Rocky Mountains outside our window right now. I mean, they can be pretty brutal and the weather can change on a dime. And if you're not super well prepared for it... um, 
it can be very dangerous. Yes. And some of the signs in Rocky Mountain National Park say the mountains don't care. So if you're going to go hang out there at a terrible time, terrible things could happen. But wow, five people. So lightning strikes, maybe something like that. Yeah. I, I don't know what all five stories are, but um, clearly it's uh, driven people to do some some fairly extreme things. I imagine that those people probably kept pushing in conditions that weren't super smart, but they, you know, had the drive to go find that treasure. So, Well, my thought about treasure hunts and the real world is something that's a little bit safer that you and I have had a little bit of fun with, or I at least have had a little bit of fun with, and you have played along and been a nice partner for me. <laughs> so back in the day, there was a company out there called Scavenger that would host these these interesting scavenger hunts. They would pair with corporations like Chevrolet or Samsung and put on these big elaborate scavenger hunts on their application that you would run around uh, the downtown area of some major city answering puzzles and solving challenges, using your route finding skills to make your way around the game board that they've created in the real world. And whoever did the best in these competitions would end up with big prizes like a car or uh, in our case, a $10,000 check uh, in order for participating in the Samsung Pursue the Infuse challenge. Um, I wish there were more of those events. I do not wish there were more of those events. So we've done four of those scavenger hunts, and we've done we've done very well in all of them. Although, um, due to some sort of shady behavior on their part, I would argue we have not always walked away with the top prize for those things. Um, they did not. Uh, they did not hold closely to the terms and conditions that they put out into the world. They deserve to be sued a little bit more than Force Fen did. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Although we never did actually pursue that. Um, and I think the company is kaput now. So, um, but yeah, we did very well in all those competitions. But I will say every single time we did it, I was so just stressed out by it and nervous about what the results were going to be that I would literally get this terrible stomach ache. I don't, yeah, I don't think I'm very well cut out for that kind of like high pressure thing. I don't think I would do well in like the amazing race, just that pressure to do, do well in like a super fast paced environment. I, I can do it, but it, I don't like it. It stresses me out a lot. I love it. I think there's nothing more thrilling than competing against a bunch of people for something that you really don't have any right to have. Uh, just some random prize that's out there. We, we did several of these. We did one that was in a mall when we lived in Dallas. That was a lot of fun. You actually had to pay to participate in that one. And we felt so good about our chances that it felt like it was a, a worthwhile thing to do. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. You got to go run around the mall, do a little scavenger hunt, a little treasure map where you had to solve puzzles. It was like an escape room in the real world. And I am always on the hunt for something like this. So if any of you listeners out there know of any real world scavenger hunt competitions that we can do and resume <laughs> our career as professional treasure hunters, let us know. We're interested. Well, I will say there are several real world treasures that are still to be found in the world today. So way more than I could list if I, you know, were to rattle them all off. But why, if you... why haven't you told me about these before? <laughs> I, what else am I doing? Let's go. So there is a, um, a famous shipwreck off the coast of Cuba that is supposed to be like the most fabulous treasure trove anywhere on planet earth um, but no one has yet been able to locate um, there's some kind of like tomb which is has actually been found but they're still like in the process of excavating a lot of the treasures that they still think are down there waiting to be found by somebody there's also um, a gold mine in arizona which was supposed to be like a super well-producing gold mine that was going gangbusters in like the 1800s and then there was a band of apaches that attacked the gold mine um, and killed all of the workers so no one who knew where it was was left alive but apparently some dutch guy um, went searching for it like many decades later and found it and told somebody on his deathbed where it was but like didn't give very clear directions and so these people went searching for it but weren't able to find it but it's theoretically still out there 
So there's but, a lot of real treasures out there. That one doesn't make sense to me. Wouldn't there have been property records? There would have been an owner of the land where this gold mine was on, and surely they would have been aware of the gold mine or their relative. If they were a worker in said gold mine and were part of the unfortunate surprise attack, their family would have known about the gold mine. There would be some heirs. Somebody clearly would have known about this. I don't buy it. I don't know, Robert. Do, 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 well, do, do. I do occasionally take trips to Arizona for work. Maybe I'll have to extend one of those in the near future. Yep, do some research on the, the lost gold mine. It's supposed to be in the Superstition Mountain Range in Arizona. All right. How big know. could that be? How big could that be? Well, in the movie, they find out about this possible treasure hunt that has been left there by One-Eyed Willie in that Chester Copper Pot. Got so close to, but never actually... S- succeeded in finding and before they decide to go make a final push for this i think the people who are coming to foreclose on their house show up and kind of give their thoughts on the matter you seem to be pretty sure yourself the foreclosure is a definite oh god am i impressed i found one-eyed willie's rich stuff i pay all my dad's bills then maybe he gets to sleep at night Instead of sitting up, trying to figure out a way for all of us to stay here. So I think uh, one of the things to talk about here is just how much these kinds of money troubles and stress affect people, right? It affects the adults. Certainly we hear him talking about his dad, like not being able to sleep at night. And it really affects the kids too. Um, there have been a lot of studies done on, you know, how kids get dramatically poorer grades and have worse outcomes in life if they're in a situation where they're not in secure housing. So it definitely does affect people in a very real way. I think most parents would, any adult who's going through that situation, as I said, 36.5% of people in some study who are going through a foreclosure met the criteria for major depression. It's not surprising that adults and homeowners who are in this kind of situation would just be upset and disappointed things have not worked out the way that they expected they feel like they're letting themselves down their family their friends they just didn't deliver on things the way that they would have wanted to and you know sometimes it's not really their fault but they're certainly going to internalize it like it is and I, i can only imagine how painful and difficult it must be to work through that yeah so this is a sobering statistic 64% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, which means they're like not that far away. They're basically one disaster away from being in a situation where foreclosure isn't impossible, right? We talked about the fact that you have to be 120 days behind and, you know, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's not like you miss a payment and that's it. You're out on the street. But, um, you know, missing one payment can be a really stressful event in someone's life and the worry that, you know, if it does happen again or and again after that and again after that, then, you know, we really are in a bad situation. What I think is really compelling is the impact on the children. So you've got little Rudy here doing his thing. And a lot of parents might think that their kids are a little bit aloof and unaware of some of this stuff because most families aren't going to say, guess what, children? I don't have enough money to pay the mortgage and we're probably going to lose the house. Nobody excitedly tells their kids about that. Probably what happens half the time is, all right, we're moving. We're going to change neighborhoods and we're going somewhere else. And suddenly the house is different or smaller or they move into an apartment or whatever the case may be. And the kids don't really necessarily know why. And I suspect most parents think they do. They do a pretty good job of hiding the strife from their kids. And I think if we look at the data and we just step back and analyze the situation, parents do a terrible job. Like, how can you actually hide that from your kids? Yeah, I don't think you can. Kids are so much more perceptive than than we think, and they overhear so many things that parents don't really mean for them to overhear. I don't think there's any way that you can keep that kind of stuff from your children past a certain age, which is probably a lot younger than you think it is. So So I read that uh, right now, 13.4 million Americans, which is about 6.2% of adults, in the United States are behind on their rent or their mortgage. And of that group, about a third of them expects foreclosure or eviction to be imminent. Yeah, that is a, that is a big number. And it's certainly, um, I mean, given how many, how few foreclosures there are that you were saying before 0.11% of homes in America were foreclosed on in 2021. 
Um, maybe that's a sign that like the storm is brewing, trouble is on the horizon, it just hasn't come to fruition yet. Well, I think it's that, but it's also that a lot of people who are not homeowners are in a much less permanent position, right? They're yeah, much more so likely uh, to face the eviction route rather than the foreclosure. Yeah, I think that's very spot on. Um, yeah, I mean, people talk about the pros and cons of homeownership versus renting, but the extra stability that you get from homeownership is not nothing. That's true. And look, you can be behind on your mortgage and it looks like you got four months to catch up. If you're behind on your rent, your landlord doesn't have to be so nice. Yeah. I I mean, it obviously depends on the terms of each individual lease, but yeah, I think it generally is less time for yeah, eviction proceedings. As long as we're not under some sort of COVID safety net can start pretty quickly. Yeah. So let's go ahead and listen to our last clip. This is sort of the final scene. The kids have been through their crazy ordeal. They found one-eyed Willie's treasure in this, stuff. <laughs> this amazing cave with this like awesome cool ship from, I don't know, the 1600s, 1700s. Like, but they blew it, right? Well, they didn't end up taking very much of the treasure at all. Sorry, this is like a slightly spoiler alert from many, many moons ago. But uh, yeah, they are able to take just a tiny bit of the treasure. Um, little, sweet little Sean Astin uh, put some of the jewels into his marble bag. And the bad guys, the Fratellis, uh, who are the ones that like chase them away from the treasure, don't find those jewels in his marble bag when they take all the jewels from the kids. And so he's able to keep those. And they find it at the last minute. Um, but before that, we have this sort of ordeal on the beach. There's this happy reunion with the kids and their parents. And then, bum, 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 here comes the bad guy with the mortgage papers trying to get him to sign, saying that he is agreeing to sell the house as opposed to going into foreclosure. So let's listen to this last clip. All right, Walsh, today's the day, so let's get this over with. Irving? I'm sorry, Irene. Come on, Walsh. We don't have all day. There's 50 more houses to tear down after yours. He's off, Brad. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Sheriff, I want you to witness this. Sorry, Dad. We had our hands on the future. We blew it to save our own lives. Sorry. That's all right. You and Brand are home safe with your mom and me. That makes us the richest people in Astoria. Walsh, you're looking at the richest people in Astoria. Now sign it. He's so right. Look, they're not going to be the richest people in Astoria for very long. They're getting evicted from their home. Okay. First of all, I hate that the guy says Astoria like that. <laughs> that always kills me. <laughs> That's not quite the way that the Ataris did it in their hit song, So Long Astoria. That is correct. Also, I feel like... This dad has the right attitude here. Now, maybe he does have a gambling problem or some other horrible spending problem that has gotten the family into the situation in the first place. We hear, again, these people are talking about the fact that there are 50 more houses to go after theirs. Yeah, and let's let's listen to the language they used, right? They didn't say after your house is, right? They said after yours, which could be applicable to a, a group of properties that he owns. But more than likely, it's just their own personal dwelling. Yeah, which means our theory that could potentially make the, the plot hold up that he is the landlord for all these other families doesn't, yeah, it, just, it doesn't actually fit. The movie just does not work <laughs> logically. Indeed, it is one of the dumber movies we've seen. <laughs> um, in any event, but I do think he has the right attitude about his family is safe and that is the most important thing. That does make him much wealthier than he would be if his kids had died, but like somehow transferred a bunch of treasure to him. Although, like if the kids had died, they wouldn't have found the treasure. I, anyway, it just, the plot doesn't hold up. <laughs> All right. I do think the dad is right that life is more important than money. No question. Sure. Absolutely right. Okay. So I want to talk about a few logical things that maybe are worth talking about if you run into One-Eyed Willie's rich stuff someday. <laughs> so who actually would own this if they found it? I remember back in 2008, you were in law school, you took a property class. I spent a bunch of time reading your textbook about the finders cases, about lost and mislaid property. Whose property is this? Is this, is this really Josh Brolin's 
rich stuff that he found or does this does this go somewhere else so it depends on where you are but according to the internet sleuths who have looked deeply into this question under oregon law certainly at the time the goonies was made um an oregon law in of like the 1600s when one-eyed willie put the treasure there no that when when the movie takes place in the 1980s there was a law in place that would have given the treasure to the Goonies. They really would have been the rightful owners of it if there was a treasure trove or mislaid property. Both of those things belong to the finder. Now, I think in other places, like I read in Florida, which is relevant because there are a lot of shipwrecks there, right? Um, They have a different kind of law to where shipwrecks, anything found on them typically belongs to the state. But in Oregon, I think it actually probably would have belonged to the Goonies. But this isn't a shipwreck. The re- the boat is in perfect functioning order. It's not no, like it. It's not the fact that it's a shipwreck. It's the fact that it's a quote treasure trove or mislaid property. Both of those two categories of property belong to the finder. Okay, I don't know that it would count as mislaid property because it wasn't left somewhere where someone would expect to find it and come back to it later. Maybe it's lost property. You could argue that because it was in a cave. Yeah, I, I think they had a separate statute that was specifically for, quote, treasure troves. And what, what makes something a treasure trove? Does it have to be like a certain amount of money? Unclear, but I'm pretty sure this would qualify. This well, is like the textbook definition of a treasure trove. Well, one I'd will. So, I mean, I'm, re- I'm deeply surprised by this and also a little bit offended. <laughs> Right. Let me think back and assume that my ancestors were the victim of this terrible, dreaded one-eyed Willie pirate. He was a pilot, a pirate, right? Correct. Okay. Pirates aren't exactly known for coming by their rich stuff by honest means. Mm -hmm. And so if you and your family had been the victim of some one-eyed Willie pillaging, shouldn't your ancestors have the opportunity to make a rightful claim on that property? I mean, ordinarily mislaid property, the original owner has the true title. And if they ever come a call in, it's theirs. Yeah. But think about the logistics that would, it would take. You'd have to figure out who or from whom one eyed Willie had plundered. You'd have to trace like each individual piece of treasure to each of those individual (laughs) victims, which PS was like several hundred years ago. Who knows if they even have surviving ancestors? And if they do, would those surviving ancestors have any clue as to what happened to their ancestors? Like three sapphires and four rupees? It just doesn't Okay, well, so let me ask you this, because this may fall under the definition of treasure trove. What if the movie came out in 1985? What if One-Eyed Willie was active in, I don't know, like 1983? And he was a pirate and he put everything in this cave and then they stumbled upon his treasure two years later after he died of some freak accident. What about then? Is it still a treasure trove? So I'm not super up on my 1980s Oregon maritime law. (sighs) What are you good for, Carla? (laughs) But my hunch would be that if you could trace the property back to its rightful owner and that was clear, certainly if something was stolen from somebody else and they could prove that, then yeah, I would go back to that rightful owner. I think that's that's pretty beyond dispute. Okay. But that's a totally different situation than what we have here. Okay. Well, let's go back to the real situation because the kids are acting like they totally blew it. There, there was all this money on the boat and they had to run away from the Fratelli brothers and they had to escape to safety and they couldn't take all the treasure with them. So why doesn't he go over and whisper to his dad? Hey, Dad, there's a, little bit of, there's a little bit of rich stuff we found. You know that Chester Copper Pot guy? We figured it out. Why doesn't he go whisper to his dad and say, Hey, we know exactly where there is a substantial pile of loot. Whatever you do, Dad, don't sign that contract. We can go back and get it. What yeah. the hell? Why didn't anybody do that? Yeah, so this is by far and away the thing that I hate the most about this movie. Like, these children walked in what on screen time is a matter of, like, seconds but surely was no more than a matter of hours from the location of this ridiculous treasure trove to their parents on the beach. And then they act as though like it's all just gone and that's it. No one can ever get back and get to it again. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. It gets even worse because (laughs) the ship full of treasure is like through this series of booby traps freed from its like 
what was previously its final resting place, and it begins to sail all on its own out into the bay, like out into the ocean, and everyone sees it sailing out. And instead of someone being like, hey, it's 1985, we've got power boats. Why don't we go? It's just jet ski on over there. Yeah, let's go get (laughs) this fucking thing. That's just one, like a matter of historical interest, if not something that's going to make a lot of people filthy rich. That it just seems like the most infuriating thing. Instead, they just sort of sit back and happily watch it sail away into the sunset. Also, this thing is a super old ship that has really old timey sails. And it's not manned by anyone. <laughs> like it's that's some perfect winds, huh? Yeah, it's definitely gonna crash in a matter of minutes, right? Or like it is not gonna be hard to chase this boat down, <laughs> get this rich stuff off the boat and back into the hands of some human being. This makes me wonder more about the title of the boat. So if Chunk and his buddies end up pushing this boat out and it goes out to sea because of their efforts. Who has title to it now? Is it just whoever finds it sitting out there in the the shallow waters? Is it do, do they who released it out there have a claim now? That's that's different. Did, I guess they abandoned ship. Yeah, I don't know. That gets way murkier because if you found it but you didn't like you know claim it and take it home and you just like sent it out into the ocean and then didn't bother to chase after it, like. That raises questions about whether you are the actual finder or like the other person who bothers to hop in a powerboat and go out and get this thing. I mean, you could, you could do this in like a little sunfish sailboat. You could have chased that thing down. <laughs> like it would not have been hard to go chase down this super old unmanned boat with like tattered sails. Well, maybe this lack of wherewithal and basic financial understanding is what caused them to get into this position in the first place. Good point. Uh, Good I point. wanted to ask Carla, did you research the value of the rich stuff? Like all this loot, that, not just the part that uh, Sean Astin and crew found and took with them, but the whole boat. Any idea what that's worth? There's not a really solid estimate on what the whole thing would be worth, but it's clearly going to be multiple, multiple, multiple millions of dollars, possibly even in, into the triple digits, millions of dollars. So there are some jewelers who have posted that if the size of the gems that we see in in Sean Astin's marble bag were real, those jewels alone could be worth anywhere from like five to ten million dollars if they were like of really good quality. In the fact that they're coming from this like sunken treasure ship that everybody sort of knew about would make them more valuable as well. So it sounds like it's worth at least four hundred paychecks. It's definitely going to cover 400 paychecks, unless maybe you're like Elon Musk and your paychecks are really, really big. But yeah, it's for a curator of a museum, it's definitely going to cover way more than 400 of his paychecks. So it was a lot of money that they watched sail out into the sea, and it was probably a lot of money that they had in their marble bag too. So one of the things that I thought was interesting in the final scene here is that you have the dad who is given, he's given up, he's given in. And he is ready to sign the paper with the sheriff watching. And he only stops signing midway through a signature, mind you, when their housekeeper, which I don't know how they're affording a housekeeper being evicted, but they have somebody who's helping them move out of their home. And she identifies the jewels that were in Sean Astin's marble bag that he'd forgotten about. And the dad, he's like mostly through signing his name. And what I wondered is... When are you done signing your name? Like when <laughs> when can you back out of a deal like that, right? I mean, it, it seems like this is a situation where there's no take backsies. Yeah. Well, so generally in order to make a legally binding contract, you need a person to make an offer of a thing or to take an action. Somebody accepts that offer and then there's some sort of consideration given for it, right? So trade for trade, money for house, money for car, I'll fix your broken air conditioning if you fix the radiator in my car. So, you know, some kind of uh, trade that that's made. So the signature on a piece of paper is generally accepted to be the way that most people make clear that they are agreeing to make this formal offer, and then on the other end that it is being accepted. So, so you, if you're signing a document, Carla Cash, like. If you write Carla C A S, 
Is it signed? Well, okay, so signatures are so squirrely, right? Like oftentimes you can't even read them. You can actually just make a mark on a piece of paper, um, especially if you are illiterate. You can just like, you know, make some sort of symbol or something and say that that counts as your signature. But it's generally accepted that when you feel like you have put your your name on something in a, such a way that that was it, that was your whole signature, and now you agree that it's done, that is enough to have like formally accepted a contract. So the signer basically declares when they're done signing their name. So yeah. you, you basically have the moments after you remove the pen from the paper to be like, whoa, I didn't actually sign this. Something happened. The housekeeper told me I was suddenly wealthy. Yeah. I don't think it's implausible that you could be halfway through signing your name and then take the pen off the paper and say, I've changed my mind. I don't, I don't actually want to accept this. And is like, if you're in the process of doing it right then and there, and you're saying like, I didn't mean for this to be my acceptance. This isn't my full name. I think that that would probably jive. That would probably stand up in court. Okay. I mean, my advice to anyone, if you're signing any kind of major agreement, you should probably think about it before you even start signing your name and settle on your decision. Yeah. But I suppose know deep, deep in the bowels of the back of your mind that you do have the ability to back out if, uh, if someone in your family recently found some rich stuff. <laughs> Stop mid-signature and uh, yeah, just you know, find that bag of marbles and everything will change. I think that about covers it for our deep dive into the world of the Goonies. I'm ready to be done with it. <laughs> Well, I really enjoyed putting together this episode, and uh, I learned a lot about, one, how ridiculous this movie actually was, which I did not catch when I watched it as a, as a little kid, and two, we learned a little about Oregon maritime law and the value of, like, rubies and sapphires. And I learned that there's a treasure hunt in Arizona I gotta get after, so <laughs> I'll see you guys later. Well, everybody be careful out there. We don't want you to be one of those folks who dies searching for treasure. But, uh, you know, if you can do it safely, I say get out there and go chase it. Good luck. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll catch you next time. Take care.